As you all know, I know a lot of people have been waiting. Um, some time ago in the series, District Court Judge Bridget Robb entered an award of attorney fees in favor of my ex and against me in the amount of $1,700, holding that I filed the motion to have her subjected to a debtor's exam as both unreasonable and an intent to harass her. So I filed a notice of appeal in the Court of Appeals said. <laughs> you serious? Let's find out where she went wrong. Alex here with part 211 of the My Docket series on um, child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We now go into the Supreme Court's order reversing. District Court Judge Bridget Robb's um, erroneous award of attorney fees to my ex. The mindset is difficult to describe in words. It's one thing to defeat your ex. I mean, it's a very emotional ordeal going through these cases. It's another thing to defeat the judge. And I know that this is not the first appeal that I've won, um, but this is the first meaningful appeal, in my opinion. The other appeal against District Court Judge Chuck Weller was mostly theoretical. I decided to do it mostly out of principle, which is not something that I recommend, um, but one of the positive, I guess, you could say outcomes of that is that I realize the judges aren't invincible. You can beat them. It would have been better if it was for more than around $50 in costs. But, um, and by the way, it's not, it wasn't just principle. It was also discussed in the video, um, low risk, low reward. So there's more of a complex sort of angle to why I did that. But in any event, I won. So it didn't waste the court's time to fix, you know, a mistake because a mistake actually did occur. And um, same thing now with District Court Judge Bridget Robb, but the difference is that it's much more money this time. It's, I think, $1,700 or something around there. So the mindset was indescribable. It was something, it is something that my viewers will probably only ever understand if they go through it themselves. Um, and I think it's an important thing for people to know, even if they're not going through it themselves, because you will at least see that, as I mentioned earlier, these family court judges aren't invincible. They can be defeated, and they do say things when they really don't know what they're talking about. Um, there were a few points during the hearing videos in this um, series where I put, you know, in big, bold letters, reversed over what the judge was saying, because, I mean, you'll hear the judge, and you'll think they really know what they're doing and what they're talking about, and what they're saying is how it works, and I have to let you guys know, and that's not really how it works. She was just guessing. She was wrong. Um, and the Court of Appeals took care of that for me. Um, I think all of that being said, well, yeah, no, I think we're ready. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look at what the Court of Appeals has filed. Here we have the Court of Appeals Order of Reversal and Remand. Standard introductory paragraph, they indicate that this is an appeal from District Court Judge Bridget Robb's order in a child custody matter, uh, specifically her order awarding attorney fees. After receiving a judgment against my ex for child support arrears, I moved for a judgment debtor exam of my ex. 
They cite the law, which allows me to do that. Respondent opposed the motion and requested attorney fees, asserting that I filed a motion to annoy or harass her over my opposition. The district court denied the request for a judgment debtor exam and awarded my ex attorney fees under 18.010 sub 2b, which is inappropriate. I talk about why this is inappropriate in the video on the topic, defend against attorney fees. Ultimately, this is a statute, it's a catch-all statute that allows the court to award attorney fees when it finds that a claim was brought or maintained without reasonable grounds or to harass someone. An award of attorney fees under that law requires the district court to determine if there was any credible evidence or reasonable basis for the claim at the time of filing. Although a district court has discretion to award attorney fees as a sanction, there must be evidence supporting the district court's finding that the claim was unreasonable or brought to harass. This is not new to the judge. I told the judge this is how it works. It was in the opposition. We cited the law. Here, the district court found that my ex was forced to oppose an unnecessary, unnecessary, so the court says, because as you all know, she hasn't paid squat for who knows how long during this series. We still haven't, I mean, it's been months and months and months. It's been so long that the termination of parental rights was allowed to go forward. Anyway, let's continue. Unnecessary motion because I had no need for the information I would obtain from a judgment debtor's exam and the request was filed only a week after the judgment was entered. But the law does not require the judgment creditor to establish a specific need for the judgment debtor's exam. A lot of times these family court judges do not read the law. They just concoct in their own mind basic principles of overarching fairness and you know the way that they want things to work and they read maybe bits and pieces of the law and they apply it sometimes but they don't actually read the statute that's why i think one of their um i think the kryptonite of most family court judges is the principles of statutory construction and i talk about that in the video statutory construction moreover Neither my ex nor the court pointed to any authority limiting the circumstances under which a judgment creditor could, could obtain a judgment debtor exam. Thus, as the district court's findings do not show that I failed to meet the established requirements of the law, we cannot include, conclude that the findings demonstrate that there was no reasonable basis for filing the motion under the statute. Moreover, to the extent that the district court may have concluded that the motion was filed to harass my ex, the court did not make any findings or point to any evidence to support such a conclusion. This is another thing that's extraordinarily common. In family court cases, the judges just decide things are true. They don't take evidence. They don't make findings. They don't hold hearings. They just decide it's true because they feel like it. This is not unusual. And this is what the Court of Appeals is upset about, is that the court said I harassed my ex, but the court didn't show any proof that was provided. It just decided I did just because. I have serious doubts that the court would have done this if it was the other way around. And what I mean by that is if you had a mother that wasn't getting child support and a father that was ducking and dodging child support. I think if it was the other way around, that the court would have not ordered this attorney fee award against you know my ex if she was the one seeking this. This is one of the things that I think still sticks around when it comes to gender bias, is that the courts have trouble accepting the fact that sometimes Moms have to pay child support. I don't think it's as much of a problem now as it was back then, but I do strongly believe that this was a situation that would not have occurred had the gender roles been flipped around. If you want to learn more about how this happens, please watch my video on the topic, gender bias. Without such findings from the family court judge, we cannot determine whether the district court properly exercised its discretion in awarding my ex attorney fees on that basis. Accordingly, we reverse the award of attorney fees to respondent under the law and remand this matter to the district court for proceedings consistent with this order. And just like that, her order awarding attorney fees can be pretty much ripped up and thrown away. And this is going to happen again. We're not done with this judge. She will screw up again. And um, it's going to happen very, very soon after this. But we'll wait until we get to that point in the process and then we'll go over that. Um, and as you can see here, the um, award of attorney fees is reviewed for an abuse of discretion. And so ultimately, the Court of Appeals is, um, they've decided that the judge has abused her discretion. Um, if you want to learn more about why this is an issue, please watch my video on the topic discretion. Going into the next, we have a memorandum of costs. So here I am taxing all these costs against my ex. Bunch of copies of papers, um, transcript being requested. If you want to learn more about memorandum of costs and how this works, please watch my video on the topic, attorney fees and costs. 
but the uh, Supreme Court rules allow you to recover costs if you are a prevailing party, and you have to just um, file a bill of costs so that you can bill your ex. Uh, then you have um, verification, where I am stating under penalty of perjury that the uh, bill of costs is true and correct. And then we have the Rule 26 Certificate of Service. Under the rules of civil procedure, it's Rule 5, but under the rules of appellate procedure, it's Rule 26. For the most part, it's the same, but it's not exactly the same. Um, next, we have the order granting costs in part. The Court of Appeals is awarding me costs in part. It looks like the cost of producing necessary copies of briefs or appendices shall be taxable. So for some reason, some of these costs are not being taxed here. What I think happens is that they, they get taxed in the lower court because I do get a cost award in the lower court. Um, I don't know why they do this. I think it's confusing for both the Supreme Court and the, the lower court judge, but for whatever reason in Nevada, a portion of the costs are recovered in the Supreme Court and a portion of the costs are recovered in the district court, even though it's an appeal. They still have you collect half there and half here. It's not act exactly half like the dollar amount. For example, it's certain things. They have a list of these things and certain things you claim in the Supreme Court and certain things you claim in the lower court. Um, and I do do file a claim for those in the lower court. That's coming. Then we have the remitter. Uh, the remitter is a, I call it the receipt. Um, kind of think of it like the end of the transaction. It's like, it's the thing that lets the lower court know that the Supreme Court is done with something. And so when the, the lower court gets the remitter, the lower court is being told by the Supreme Court, we're done, you can take control of these issues again. Um, I talk about this a little bit more in the video titled um, Jurisdiction Divested on Appeal, if you wanna learn a little bit more about this. I think I also talk about it in the video Notice of Appeal. Certificate or clerk certificate, and this is just a Supreme Court clerk indicating that this document is being served upon the district court clerk. And here we have uh, the memorandum of costs and disbursements. This is being sent down to the lower court to let them know that I am going to be taxing costs for this. So it must be the mailing maybe that wasn't allowed. Possibly it was the mailing because they did allow me to ta a tax cost for the copy. Okay, let's go on. And this isn't really much. The lower court uh, costs that I tax are over $250. Going into the aftermath, I filed two documents and they were free filing, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex didn't file anything, so she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex didn't have an attorney, so she incurred zero dollars in attorney fees as well. As my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below and I will see you guys next time.